Hi, engineering. So we're going to be in metabolic map part three. And now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how amino acids are being metabolized and how that feeds into this overall intertwining of these pathways. So if you haven't already seen it, watch part one, which is on the carbohydrates, part two, which is on the lipids, and now part three is going to be specifically focusing on proteins or amino acids in this case. Okay, so when we actually eat, right, let's say that we take in a cheeseburger or a steak or something like that, something that actually is going to be with meat, right, that can be rich in a lot of proteins. Well, whenever we take these actual proteins and whenever we eat it, we actually digest it down to the molecular unit of it, the amino acids, and we absorb it across the digestive tract. Whenever they're taken into certain organs, like for example, the skeletal muscles or the cardiac muscles or the liver and different tissues in the body, they can be converted and stored inside of our muscles and what's called proteins. So proteins are basically just these, these large polymers of amino acids. So proteins, if you guys think about proteins, proteins are just polymers of amino acids. Like for example, let's say I string out here. Here's a whole protein. So on a protein, you know that a protein has an amino end and on one end it has a carboxyl end. And each, there's these little dots that I'm drawing here and these little dots are supposed to represent amino acids. And what's really important is that whenever we need to, if our body needs to, it can break down proteins. It doesn't want to. This is usually the last source of energy. You don't really want to have to break down your proteins, your skeletal uh, functional proteins within the body because it usually means that you have, have been starving for a while. You haven't been taking in food adequately. So you don't want to be breaking down proteins. This also can happen if there's excessive long-term stress, like due to elevated levels of cortisol too. Okay, but we're not going to get into that. So specifically, let's say that I take these proteins and for whatever reason, whether it be due to severe stress, whether it be due to a very, very low carbohydrate intake or prolonged starvation, I break them down into their, their little individual units. So what is this called when I break down the proteins into amino acids? So when I break down these proteins into these individual small units, what are these individual small units called? They are called amino acids. Now amino acids, what's special about amino acids, we're not going to go into super detail, I just want you to understand really what makes them different. They have what's called an amine terminus, which is like this NH3 plus side. They have a carbon, which is called the alpha carbon with this alpha hydrogen coming off of it. And then also has an R group, which makes each amino acid different from one another. And then at the other end, it's going to have this carboxy terminus. So this is the general structure of an amino acid. And again, the R group varies from amino acid to amino acid. But what happens is, in certain situations, there's some special amino acids that can be utilized for energy. The main ones that our body utilizes, you can utilize many of these amino acids, but some of them that we utilize a lot of is alanine. These are some of the more commonly used ones. Aspartate glutamate. These are some of the, the main ones, but we can utilize other different types of amino acids. These are just some of the more common ones that are utilized within the body, very, very uh, in large amounts. What I can do is I can take these amino acids and I can react them with a special type of Krebs cycle intermediate. So you know, you know what these Krebs cycle intermediates are called? They call them keto acids. And keto acids, again, all these keto acids are, they're just Krebs cycle intermediates, okay? And what is special about these Krebs cycle intermediates, I'm not going to draw all their structures. I'm going to just put a couple carbons here. And I'm going to say they have a specialized oxygen, this carbonyl group here. Okay? This is my keto acid. And this is my amino acid. What I'm going to do is, I'm going to react these two together. I'm going to react these two together. I'm going to take the amine group from this amino acid and give it to this keto acid. I'm going to take the oxygen from this keto acid and give it to the amino acid. And then I'm going to form something different in the end. What would happen if I give an amine group from this amino acid to that keto acid? Well, what if he has a carboxy terminus at one point here? And I ended up giving him, let's say by some chance, I actually give him an amine group at the end. Oh, would that actually be something like an amino acid? Yeah, so this guy would become a new amino acid. And then this amino acid, if it loses that amine group and it gains this oxygen, wouldn't it look something like this keto acid? Yeah. So you get a new keto acid. 
Okay, that's pretty cool. If that happens, then what does that call when I take a keto acid? For example, one of the more common ones in the body that we utilize a lot in this process is called alpha keto glutarate. Okay, let's just say that I use that one. And for this amino acid, I use some generic amino acid. It doesn't have to be anything special. It could be one of the amino acids. If that happens, let's go over here and look real quickly at what this kind of looks like. Okay, well, if I take an amino acid, I react it with a keto acid, and then I make a new keto acid and a new amino acid, what is that called? Transamination, okay? That's called transamination. And we're gonna do that with a purple marker, right? So whenever this keto acid here, so let's draw it from this guy here, getting converted into this new amino acid, and this amino acid reacting right here gets converted into this new keto acid, what is this actually called? It's called transamination. Why do you call it transamination? Because the amine group is being transferred onto the keto acid, and the oxygen is being transferred to the amino acid. Also, it is very, very dependent upon these enzymes called transaminases. Okay, these transaminase enzymes are very, very important enzymes in these steps because the enzymes are what help to be able to catalyze this reaction here. Okay, so we're at that point. Now, let's say I take this new amino acid, and usually this amino acid, if you start off with alpha ketoglutarate, the most common type that you generate from this transamination process is usually what is referred to as glutamate. Okay, it's usually in the form of glutamate. But our body, this glutamate that we generate, because this transamination process can happen in many tissues, but this next step is really only happening within the liver and a little bit in the muscles. Very, very little, but a little bit in the muscles. Not very much at all in the muscles, but a very, very small amount. This glutamate can actually have this next process occur. Actually, let's, let me erase this because we don't want to do this just yet. Okay, so now if I actually have this glutamate, what I'm going to do is, glutamate has an amine on him, right? He has an amine group on him. I'm gonna rip that amine group off. So let me pop this amine group off of this glutamate. I'm gonna rip off an amine group, okay, off of this guy, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna add an actual H to it. So I'm gonna get this thing right here. You see this NH3 group? This NH3 is called ammonia. And ammonia, ammonia is extremely neurotoxic, okay? So I'm gonna produce this molecule here called ammonia. But another thing that I'm gonna get out of this is I'm also gonna regenerate a very interesting molecule which is called alpha keto glutarate. Hmm. What is this called whenever I take glutamate, get rid of an amine group in the form of ammonia, and then form alpha keto glutarate? Well, let's look. Oh, isn't this right here? Glutamate, which is an amino acid, the new one that we made, gets converted into a keto acid, and that keto acid is alpha keto glutarate, and I get rid of uh, ammonia in the form of the amine group, right? What's that called? Oxidative deamination. Okay, so this process here of me getting, converting this guy into this guy, and also generating this guy as a side product, this is called oxidative deamination. Now, some people be like, oh, you're removing the amine group. Isn't that transamination? No, because when I move, remove the amine group, I'm not transferring it onto anybody. And also, there's a special enzyme involved in this process, just so that we're very clear. This enzyme involved in this process is actually called glutamate dehydrogenase. Okay, and this involves a very important development of NADPHs. We're not gonna talk too much about that. We already did in great detail um, in other videos with this whole amino acid metabolism. Okay. Now, this ammonia, since it's toxic, we don't want it to stay in the body in that form. We want to get rid of it in another form. So what we do is we take this ammonia in the liver and we convert this ammonia into a molecule called urea, which is still toxic but a lot less toxic, okay? And then this urea will go to the kidneys and it'll be excreted, okay? So it'll be excreted from the kidneys. So we get rid of that ammonia in that form. What is this called whenever I convert ammonia into urea? This is called the urea 
cycle. And this is very important. This has to happen so that we can convert into less toxic form. Okay? Now, what can happen with this alpha ketoglutarate and what can happen with these new keto acids? Well, it all depends. For example, let's say that you do alanine. If you have alanine as one of the amino acids, one of the keto acids that you can generate from this process is actually called pyruvate. So let's do these in order. You get pyruvate. If you have aspartate reacting in this process, you'll convert him into what's called oxaloacetate. If you have glutamate reacting in this process, this will be converted into alpha keto glutarate. Now, let's think about this for a second. Where are all of these guys? Well, pyruvate, where was he at? Huh? Oh, he was right here. Oxaloacetate, I mentioned him very briefly, right? Where did we say he was at? Oh, he was right here in the Krebs cycle. Guess where alpha ketoglutarate is also found? Alpha ketoglutarate is found actually within the Krebs cycle also. So it's also found within the Krebs cycle. Now this is really interesting. I can take this new keto acid that I made and I can funnel him in to this process here. So for example, if I were to do this, let's say I took this pyruvate right here and I'm going to put a line here because I'm going to feed this in through here. Let's say that I take this keto acid, like I take pyruvate and I convert this right here into pyruvate, right? So I take this new keto acid that I formed and there it is, I make pyruvate. Or I take this oxaloacetate, feed that in there. Or I generate alpha ketoglutarate and I funnel that into there. You know what's really interesting about this? Watch this. So now, let's bear with me for just a little second here. We didn't talk about this pathway just yet. We didn't write it down really either. But I want to talk about it individually because it's a, it's a whole bunch of different processes interconnected. So now, if I take these amino acids and I convert into pyruvate, well, you know pyruvate, we talked about this in the gluconeogenesis video. Technically, there's a step in between where actually this is getting converted into pyruvate. And that molecule is called phosphoenolpyruvate. If you guys remember, we called it PEP short for PEP. When phosphoenolpyruvate is going to pyruvate, it's actually, an, it's not reversible, right? This is, an, that's an irreversible step, but these pathways are kind of irreversible. What can happen is, I'm going to take this pyruvate, I'm going to convert it into acetyl-CoA, and then what will happen is I'll go and make OAA. But look what can happen with that OAA. Watch this. I'm going to take this OAA, and I'm going to eventually convert him into phosphoenolpyruvate. PEP. What can happen with this PEP? This can go up to glyceraldehyde-3-phosphate. It can eventually go up to fructose-1,6-bisphosphate. It can go through certain enzymes, and if it's in the liver or in the kidneys or in the GIT, it can make glucose. What is this whole process here called with these blue lines? This whole process of moving it up, I'm only going to write it right here, but again, this whole process, if you follow the pyruvate to this way, going down into acetyl-CoA, OAA, up to phosphoenolpyruvate, all the way up. This is called gluconeogenesis. Oh, it's so beautiful. You know what else is really cool? Remember this glycerol here? I wanted to tell you that there was another pathway. Remember I told you that one way is it's gonna go down, but we didn't talk about a lot yet? Guess what, this glycerol can be converted into uh, this dihydroxyacetone phosphate, right? Guess what can happen? He can get converted into fructose 1-phosphate. And then from fructose 1-phosphate, he can get converted into glucose. What is that called? It's called gluconeogenesis. It's, it's amazing. So again, this is called gluconeogenesis. And again, what can happen with these guys if you imagine? For example, if, this, uh, if it comes from oxaloacetate, what will happen? If it comes from oxaloacetate, it'll go right into oxaloacetate, into phosphoenolpyruvate, and then up to glucose. If it comes from alpha ketoglutarate, then what will happen? Well, the alpha ketoglutarate will actually go into the Krebs cycle. It'll undergo these different steps. It'll eventually get converted into OAA, oh, phosphoenolpyruvate, and then into glucose. But you know what else can happen? Think about just this. Not only can those amino acids be utilized to make glucose through gluconeogenesis, but if we really need them, if we really need them for energy, what can happen? During this process, I can generate FADH2s, I can generate NADHs, I can take that to the electron transport chain and make 
ATP. So this process of this utilizing these amino acids in these actual glycolytic pathway can either be for two reasons. One, one thing that can come from this whole pathway is two things. One is gluconeogenesis. That's one thing that it can result from this. The second thing is you can make ATP. That's it's cool. I think that's really cool. And again, this alpha ketoglutarate right here, guess what? You can either regenerate him or he can also be using this process also. So it's amazing. You know, there's one more mechanism for gluconeogenesis, and then we're going to finish this up. You know, there's a molecule called lactic acid. Lactic acid, you know, you generate lactic acid from, you know, we can get this lactic acid from skeletal muscles. So, you know, you can produce lactic acid from muscles, right? You know what's really interesting is that let's say this is our muscles and our muscles are producing this lactic acid. So it's producing this lactic acid. What can happen is this lactic acid can get taken up by the muscles. I'm sorry, by the, by the liver. So this lactic acid can be taken up by the liver. And this lactic acid can be converted into pyruvate. What can pyruvate be converted into if we need to? Well, it can either go down and be used for ATP, but what else could happen? It could go down here to acetyl-CoA. It could go through this whole process here to make OAA. It could go back up to phosphoenolpyruvate, then back up to GA3P, back up to fructose 1,6-phosphate, and then up to glucose. What is that called? Gluconeogenesis. So I want you guys to remember three different substrates that can be used for gluconeogenesis. What are those three substrates for gluconeogenesis? Let's write them down here the, in the end corner here. So three substrates for gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis, you can take amino acids. I'm going to put AA. You can take lactic acid, or you can take glycerol and convert these structures into glucose. And if it is converted into glucose, this is as a whole called gluconeogenesis. Technically, there is one more substrate, but it, it, it contributes to very, very, very minimal amounts. I'll add it in there in a different color, but it's not that important. It's odd chain fatty acids. In other words, instead of it being 16 carbons, it would be like 17 carbons. And it will produce a three carbon fragment that could eventually be converted into glucose. All right. All right, guys. So. In this video, we covered a lot of information. We basically tried to intertwine and see how all these pathways are connected because that's really what you want to be able to do. Memorizing pathways individually is, that's awesome. But to see how these pathways are actually intertwined and actually interacting together is really the basic principle of metabolism because that's what we really want to get. How are these pathways reacting in our body in that basis, all right? So, all right, engineers, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope it all made sense. If it did, please hit the like button, subscribe, put some comments down in the comment section. All right, engineers, as always, until next time.